our first reading. Forgive me. Our first reading is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The second reading comes from John 6, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. Amen. So um, our, we do have some young folks here, but I hope all of us of any age might appreciate this. The gospel reading that Ms. Gibson just read talks about one of the times that Jesus fed a lot of people with just a little bit. Now, I'm not focusing today on the gospel passage in this time with the children and youth and also in the sermon, but it fits really well uh, with the reading from the letter to the believers living in Ephesus. Jesus feeding 5,000 people with only a little shows many things. It shows that he's very powerful, 
and a prophet as they realize at the end of our passage. But it also shows a way, it's also a way of talking about abundance and God's love in Jesus is more than we would ever need. As we just heard, there is so much food in the story that even after everyone ate their fill, over 5,000 people, they still had 12 baskets of leftovers. And these baskets weren't just little baskets, they would have been very large baskets. So the Ephesians passage is probably my favorite passage in the Bible. Well, at least it's in the top 10 or top five. I will talk more about that in my sermon, but there is a little book that I wanted to read because I think it's another way of talking about what we read about both in that gospel passage about God's abundance, but also in Ephesians 3.18. And that verse says, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, some of you may be familiar with this story already. I hope uh, maybe so. If so, please let everyone know during fellowship time. Uh, it was written after I was already a grown up. So I learned to love this little book uh, by reading it to my daughter when she was very little. It's entitled Guess How Much I Love You. And it was written by Sam McBratney and illustrated by Anita Jerome. See if you can see how this book uh, that talks about big love is a little bit like God's love for you and for every single person. I'm going to take a sip of water. Try to get it so at least you can see the pictures. Little nut brown hair who was going to bed held on tight to big nut brown hair's very long ears. He wanted to be sure that big nut brown hair was listening. Guess how much I love you, he said. Oh, I don't think I could guess that, said big nut brown hair. This much, said little nut brown hair, stretching out his arms as wide as they could go. Big nut brown hair had even longer arms. But I love you this much, he said. Hmm, that is a lot, thought little nut brown hair. I love you as high as I can reach, said little nut brown hair. I love you as high as I can reach, said big nut brown hair. That's very high, thought little nut brown hair. I wish I had arms like that. Then little nut brown hair had a good idea. He tumbled upside down. He uh, and reached up the tree trunk with his feet. I love you all the way up to my toes. And I love you all the way up to your toes, said Big Nut Brown Hair, swinging him up over his head. I love you as high as I can hop, laughed Little Nut Brown Hair, bouncing up and down. But I love you as high as I can hop, said Big Nut Brown Hair, and he hopped so high that his ears touched the branches above. That's good hopping, thought Little Nut Brown Hair. I wish I could hop like that. I love you all the way down the lane as far as the river, cried Little Nut Brown Hair. I love you across the river and over the hills, said Big Nut Brown Hair. That's very far, thought Little Nut Brown Hair. 
He was almost too sleepy to think anymore. Then he looked beyond the thorn bushes out into the dark night. Nothing could be farther than the sky. I love you right up to the moon, he said and closed his eyes. Ooh, that's far, said Big Nut Brown Hair. That's very, very far, Big Nut Brown Hair settled Little Nut Brown Hair into his bed of leaves. He leaned over and kissed him goodnight. Then he lay down close by and whispered with a smile, I love you right up to the moon and back. So I hope that this book helped remind us all that God loves us more than we can even understand. But we remind each other of God's big love often so that we never forget, both as individual people and as a congregation trying to serve God. Let's pray. God, thank you for the way you love everyone. Your love is so amazing, we cannot take it in. Help us to know with our hearts what our minds can't always understand, that you love us all the time, even when we make some bad choices. Thank you. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Like the words of a favorite song, the words of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21 echo through my life. Perhaps there are passages of scripture like that in your life too. I relied on my memory when my eyes teared up so badly when reading this scripture at my sister's wedding decades ago. And only a few years after that, this prayer from Ephesians was read at my ordination to the ministry in the Presbyterian Church USA. These eight verses written by either Paul or someone who admired and followed Paul writing in his style, these eight verses have so many layers to them. They speak so much truth at different times of life. I've said it before, and you'll hear it again. The beauty of scripture is the way in which, in a special way, the Holy Spirit shows us time and again how its stories, poetry, wisdom, all of this can speak in fresh ways, depending upon what's happening in the life of the world. For me, the danger in preaching on this beloved text is that I will fall into the trap of a new preacher on their first Easter Sunday. I will try to say too much and end up saying not much at all. I hope that as you read or heard these verses again, or possibly for the first time, that they struck a chord within you as well. For me, this prayer is both a realization and an inspiration. It's a realization of something I see that's already present in the church and in my life. And it's an inspiration for what can be an even greater fulfillment in the future. Now, so that I don't get lost in the layers and that you don't get lost in the layers, I will steal my own thunder and highlight this sermon's main point. When we are rooted and grounded in God's love in Christ, both as individuals, but also importantly, as a community of believers, it's God's power, not our own effort, that accomplishes amazing things. <laughs> 
So a quick word from last week about the context of the letter to the church at Ephesus. Remember, if you were here, you might remember the little map that shows that Ephesus is up in what we now call Turkey. So it's quite a bit away from Jerusalem where uh, Judaism was the dominant uh, religious and cultural practice. So now in Ephesus, um, more and more Gentiles are also worshiping. So people who were steeped in Jewish faith, as well as people who had really no religious background that we would understand, um, who practice no religion, these were coming together to follow Christ in the same congregation. And that naturally caused some um, issues of understanding. So they heard the good news from the missionary and apostle Paul. So this diverse church in its infancy in the first 50 years of Christianity as we understand it. Um, and Paul or someone writing in his style speaks in chapter one about Gentile and Jew being adopted into God's family. In chapter two, they write about the reconciliation. That's what we looked at last week that Christ brings tearing down the barriers. And here in chapter three, we hear this beautiful prayer and blessing for the congregation in Ephesus. And naturally, as we believe that scripture still speaks to us, this prayer is a blessing for this congregation and for all communities of faith. Now, until the last few years, I'd have to confess, I have pretty much always read Ephesians 3 as an individual, a prayer for me as an individual, hearing its assurance of God's love, about me and my personal discipleship. But now that I've been in ministry quite a bit of time, I see it more relevant to our lives as congregations, as communities of believers. Now, of scripture doesn't have to be one thing, it's both and. So, but if you are like me and tend to read things as solely about your personal relationship with God, I'd invite you to consider going back to some favorite passage in the Bible that you love and that echoes in your life and read that passage through the lens of God's speaking, not just to you and not solely to you, but to the whole world, to this congregation of South Plains, to some other community and hear what fresh things the spirit might be saying to you. Much of the Hebrew scriptures, uh, the, what we call the Old Testament, would have been heard by those first hearers as about them as a people, not as individual believers. <clears throat> if you have the capability, I invite you to, uh, there's an easy way to find scripture on a website uh, and then cut and paste it into a document and print that out if you don't want to mark up one of your Bibles, but a fun thing can do to do uh, as we reflect on scripture is to do a word study. Many of you probably have done this. You get out some highlighters or colored pens or pencils and on this printed out copy, or if you're really bold, you do it in your Bibles. You read the passage a few times and then you use the different colors to highlight words that are repeated or phrases that kind of jumped out at you either in a devotional way, as in they were inspiring off the bat or something that you were puzzled by. Uh, as I did this, you can also underline and write things in the margin about inspirations that you've received. In doing this myself, in addition to the importance of love, which of course is central, I couldn't help but notice uh, that the prayer says, I pray that I pray that this, I pray that this, and uh, I pray so that, in other words, it's a lot of uh, petitions to God about things uh, that uh, Paul or the writer wants to happen for this congregation. Uh, but there's also this repetition of the word power, which is a word that I don't always use in my faith journey. So when the prayer speaks of strength in the inner being, and Christ dwelling in our hearts, an individual reading is easy to hear and it's understandable. Uh, but remember that it's a letter to a community that has a kind of inner being, just as South Plains has an inner being as a community of faith. 
but I just couldn't help but share this one example of an individual reading that struck me. Uh, it's from a commentary called Feasting on the Word, and it describes Anne Lamott's profound experience of Christ in dwelling in her heart. She writes in her book, Traveling Mercies, that she was dealing with addiction and a lot of other challenges and was not uh, a big believer, let's put it that way. After a botched medical procedure, she began to hemorrhage in the middle of the night. And this is where the commentary tells us about what she writes. It was that night that she became aware of someone in the room with her. She writes, the feeling was so strong that I actually turned on the light for a moment to make sure no one was there. Of course, there wasn't. But after a while in the dark again, I knew beyond any doubt that it was Jesus. What she felt was appalled in her circle of family and friends. Nobody was a Christian. They were all like the Ephesians, worldly, sophisticated, and in need of no one but themselves. But Jesus remained in the corner. She writes, watching me with patience and love, and I squinched my eyes shut. But that didn't help because that's not what I was seeing him with. She had been going to church for some Sundays, drawn into a little funky church, mostly by the music. The next Sunday, she went back. She could not escape the feelings. It was as if the people were singing in between the notes, weeping and joyful at the same time. And I felt like their voices or something was rocking me in its bosom, holding me like a scared kid. And I opened up to that feeling and it washed over me. When she got home, she opened the door, hung her head and said to Jesus, I can't repeat it, expletive it, I quit. She actually said this out loud, all right, you can come in. Now, not all of us have such dramatic moments of inviting Christ into our hearts. Perhaps you did, but I think for many of us, it's a gradual process, a series of gentle moments, maybe as a child, maybe as an adult, maybe both, uh, when Christ makes more and more a home in our hearts in deeper and more profound ways. Uh, even though this is my favorite, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, I've only preached on it a couple of times. And one of those was just about eight weeks ago at the church I served in Colorado for seven years, and that's Wheat Ridge Presbyterian Church. I uh, echoed this prayer for them the way I also feel it for us as a congregation. Uh, like South Plains, uh, Wheat Ridge is a purple church with a mix of people with differing political and cultural views, yet bound together by the love of God and the love for one another. There are a little over 100 official members, including a few families with children or teenagers, and there are friends who are faithful but who have not joined. This probably sounds familiar. The congregation is like many uh, in all kinds of uh, stripes, especially in this um, in the cultural waters in which we swim and sail. Uh, it was suburban and founded when churches simply opened their do doors, uh, new doors usually, to folks living in the new subdivisions nearby and the pews were full. Wheat Ridge is still a very vibrant place with wonderful music, faithful worship, and Christian education, meaningful service both in the local community and globally. Like many other congregations of many stripes, again, this is not limited to Presbyterian churches, uh, where their membership was several hundred people 25 years ago, it can be disheartening for longer term members to see a smaller congregational uh, gathering with more folks who are retired than still in the workplace. Uh, this is true uh, based on looking back to the heydays of the 1970s, 80s, and even 90s. Our expectations of anything in life shape our understanding of effectiveness or what we term success. 
The prayer in Ephesians to be strengthened in one, one's inner being applies to congregations as well. There is so much to be celebrated in the life of smaller congregations like Wheat Ridge and like South Plains. I see God strengthening congregation or congregations' inner being when they aim to be vital, welcoming, inclusive, and focused on being faithful disciples in this hour for this time as God calls. That may or may not involve growing in numbers, and that's just fine. As I reflected on communities being rooted and grounded in love, I remembered another echo of Ephesians 3, the only other time I can remember preaching on Ephesians 3. Twelve years ago, I preached about this passage at Heritage Presbyterian Church in Northern Virginia as a guest preacher. This is the congregation whose high school youth group and even college age group I attended faithfully for years. In addition to my family and my home church uh, in Alexandria, it played a vital role in my faith formation. In 2009, people returned from really all over the country for a reunion 25 or even 30 years after graduating from high school and therefore probably moving on to uh, different uh, communities of faith. What was so striking was like branches of a tree with roots going deep, many of us had diverged in our understanding of God's call and who Jesus is in our lives. Some of us with an affinity for the left, I'll lean left here, and others for the right. But so many of us were still committed members or leaders and even pastors of Presbyterian or other kinds of churches. Being rooted and grounded in love, we looked past those differences to be reminded of the common roots we share as followers of Christ. This was not and is not a surface connection, but a real bond of love. My guess is that here, uh, at South Plains, there are folks like that. Your relationships with each other, if you've been longtime members, uh, have been built over years of service and worship together, committee meetings, attending memorial services, and joyous celebrations of baptisms and weddings. All this reminds you that your shared love of and love by God means that the community bonds are stronger even though, and maybe through those differences. The prayer in Ephesians chapter three continues with this expansive picture that the little book highlighted of God's love in Christ. It's a prayer that we somehow know the unknowable breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. The abundance of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is here in the prayer that they be filled with all the fullness of God. Like little nut brown hair and big nut brown hair in the children's book, Guess How Much I Love You, the writer is expressing what so many of us feel in the face of this great love, an inability to take it all in or to express it in words. Finally, in the closing verses of our passage, the writer highlights something each of us as individuals and all of us as a community of faith can embrace. Being rooted and grounded in the love of God in Christ, we can trust that it is God's power, not our own effort that accomplishes amazing things. Invariably, when I prepare to preach, I end up learning something new, and that is even true of this very familiar passage. When we take the view of the letter as a whole, this prayer is a hinge between the first three chapters when the writer tells the community about the many things that God has done, adopting, reconciling, grounding in love, and prepares the way for the second three chapters of Ephesians that explore how we are to live in response, both as individuals and as a community of faith. So stay tuned for more on that in the coming three Sundays.
In the meantime, I will simply repeat some of these cherished verses for us as a community to hear once again. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.